We're going to continue the series of lessons that we've started, and uh, this one is, um, there's a lot to cover. I think I say that about every week I stand in front of here. There's a lot here. The Bible is, uh, as um, one person has said, an inexhaustible barrel. You can just keep going to it and keep going to it, and so we won't try to exhaust the barrel this morning, but I do have uh, a lot to go over, we're talking about our enemy. Uh, in this series in the class right now, we're talking about uh, what's next or what we might say just foundational truths for believers. This is um, this information, we shouldn't look on it like, oh, I'm way past that. Is there something about human nature, stuff that we passed a while ago, we need again? Uh, because our flesh, our spirit, our fallen nature that is bent not toward God, um, it easily forgets just the basics. So it's good for us to review these things. And the last two weeks, we've talked about our enemy. There's uh, the, the, the devil, the flesh, and the world. And this morning, we're going to talk about the world. Um, if you, some of you probably have the handout, so you know, but if you, yeah, let's just forget the question answer format, because uh, you have the answers. And one of the most is this dying? I looked away or something. Okay, I'm trying to. One of the most, um, I think, one of the most easily remembered verses that the Bible gives, that's in the Bible about the world, is 1 John 2 15, 16, 17, the passage there. And in verse 16, we see, uh, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So we're going to be, you, look, use, that verse will show up over and over again throughout this lesson. We have many other passages that I will read to, and bring into the lesson uh, this morning. So the world works, I don't know how we say it, we say it this way, the world works hand in hand with the first two enemies that we discussed. I was thinking about this through the first couple lessons as Pastor Olson was teaching. Um, there's there's, there's um, discussion, let's say. There's, people wonder, uh, are, is, the human, are, is a human person uh, a two-part or three-part? Are they soul and spirit or, or, or soul and body or spirit, soul, and body? And probably the answer is yes. Um, but... I was thinking the body, our bodies, obviously that's really closely connected to our flesh. The spirit, the devil is a person, but he's a spirit. And the soul, to me, is uh, the part of us that associates with the world. If you're wondering what is the world or what is the soul, okay, my spirit, where I talk to God, it's the devil fights me there. My flesh is what walks on the earth here, but my soul is what connects me to other people and to this place where I live that's called the world. So these, uh, and, and so is, am I three people in one? No. The, all of those things, our spirit and our soul and our body work together. They work together for good. And our fallen spirit, soul, body work together for bad. Um, so Satan, he uses things in the world to appeal to our flesh. We can just, we could talk around this a whole lot. We can't blame when we fall on the devil. He tempts us, but in the end, the Bible tells us that when, when we fall, it's our fault. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed, and then we give in to it. Um, but we, we can be tempted through the Satan can use things in the world to tempt us. He can use our flesh to tempt us. He can just flat out lie to us. In fact, everything that the devil says is a lie. I was listening to a message yesterday where, um, you know, I'm going to, you, you've heard the, the song, This is My Father's World. And a very good pastor friend of ours once said, that's a lie uh, because the, the Bible says Satan is the God of this world. Well, he's a lowercase God. He's not the God of this world. 
Now he came to Jesus and said, look at all the kingdoms of the world. These are mine, and if you worship me, I'll give them to you. But what is the devil? He's a liar. He thinks these kingdoms of the world are his. He, he, those are not his. So anyway, he's a liar. He lies to us. He straight just tells us things, and we believe him. The Bible just, uh, uh, Satan will just come to us and lie to us, tell us we're, we're whatever, uh, but we believe that because our nature likes that. Our old nature, hopefully, or our fallen nature, if you've not trusted Christ as your Savior, you've not been made a new creature, your fallen nature likes to listen to the devil. If you have been made a new creature in Christ, your old nature likes to listen to the devil, and we have to fight that. But today we're going to talk about the world. What is the world. When, I, when we were thinking about this, when I was thinking about this, I thought of the verse uh, in Psalm 24. Psalm 24 starts out with these words. The earth is the Lord, and Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So that verse kind of gives us a contrast, all related to where we are here, or a comparison. We have the earth and the fullness thereof, the ground, the minerals, the, the, all, everything that's related to the earth. But then the world is, the world lives on the earth. The, the earth is not the world. The world lives on the earth, inhabits the earth, and they that dwell therein. They that dwell therein, in their um, combined fallen nature, create um, or contribute uh, to the world. The world is used a couple different ways in the Bible. You might think immediately of John 3.16, where the Bible says, for God so loved the world, right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So well, if God loves the world, we should love the world. But a little bit later, <laughs> the Bible says, love not the world, right? In our verses um, in 1 John 2.15. So what is this? The, is the world, because the Bible says it that way, there would be two things the world is re referring to. And I think that in John 3.16, we can see right from that verse what, who the world is, right? The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever. So in this instance, the world is, is each whosoever, each individual person in that inhabits the earth is the world, and God loves each and every one of them. That whosoever believes in him, believeth in him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. So God loves the world, all the people of the world, all the children of the world, whatever <laughs> comes to your mind, God loves all those people. We should love everyone in the world. Now, that we're, that's hard to do. But we should, God loves them, we should love them. But just to just move on, that's not the subject of our lesson. Every person in the world, individually, no person in the world individually is our enemy, but the world system is our enemy. So the other idea of the world that we see throughout the Bible is the human system that runs the, the earth, that runs the world. This human system, and I say it's, it, uh, we, we can, the more conspiratorial we are, we, we see like there's a, there's a human design to it. I think there's a, and even Satan is not the best designer, but he's organized some things. I think it's just all fallen human nature that lives in natural rebellion against God gets together. They don't have good thoughts. And so there's all kinds of bad, evil thoughts in the world that um, work toward organizing the world and accomplishing their, um, their rebellious ideas. So let's just, I'll just read you a few verses that, that the Bible, that are in the Bible, that kind of refers to the world in this sense as opposed to the individual people of the world. In Matthew, Jesus in the parable of the sowers talks about the, the seed that fell among Thorns in Matthew 13, 22, he also that received seed among the thorns is he that hears the word and the care of this world. The care of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the, wor choke the word, he becomes unfruitful. So the care of this world is 
It's bigger than just this person or that person or another person. It's a world system. Uh, John 12, 31. Uh, Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. In, verse, in John 15, 19, it says, if ye were of the world, the world would love his own. So Jesus is speaking uh, to his disciples there, I believe, and every single person on the earth is part of the world that, Jesus, that God loved, right? But here he says they're not of the world. So there's a, the, the Bible's using the world in another, uh, with another meaning. If you are of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. If you are saved, God chose you, and he chose you out of the world. We should, we should shun the world. We should hate the world. We should not love the world, but this world is a different world than the world the Bible uses when it says God loved the world. Uh, Colossians 2, 8, 2, 8. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. So there's a, there's, a, there's a basic way that the world thinks, that the world um, works, that the world operates in, the rudiments of the world, and these are things that we should not be a part of. James 4.4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So we are to, we are to shun the world in this, in this sense. Um, the world system is evil. It's the framework that the world works under. Um, 1 John 2.16 says, all that is in the world the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And we are not to love the world. We might say we're even to hate the world. We're to love the people of the world. Um, but we are, we, are, we are not to love the world. Love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Why do we even have a command this way? Why does God give us a command? Love not the world. Let's be honest. He commands us against our inclinations. In, throughout the Bible, I mean, there's several commands, but many times when there is a specific, he commands husbands to love their wives. Why? Because that's the thing that's hard for us to do. We love ourselves. We might respect our wives. We might think, oh, they're whatever, but to love them the way Christ loved the church, that's the thing we need. He says, you need to do that. He commands wives to respect reverence their husbands. Why? Because that's the thing that's hard to do. They can love their husbands. They can do all these things, but they can harbor resentment. But that's against the Bible. He commands us not to love the world. Why? Because we would like to love the world. We live in this world. We want to fit in. There's so much glamour here. There's so many neat things here that we want to just accept and just um, not feel bad when we're out there with the world and be accepted by the things that are in the world. So he commands us, love not the world. Um, the world system produces temptations, but it is just a, to me, it's an entity besides the temptations it produces. I mean, it produces temptations because it's just evil to the core. What is it made up of? Unbelievers. Unbelievers, it's all unbelievers, and those unbelievers with the influence of the devil and giving in to their flesh, they create something that is the world. And that is tempting. 
because we're human nature. We have a flesh. We have a soul. We have a soul that wants to associate with other people. And so it's a temptation to us. It is, therefore, our enemy. So we think of this worldly temptations maybe as things that tempt our flesh, but the world's way of thinking tempts us also. There's a, there's a way to think like the world, and there's a way to think like heaven. The Bible says, set your affection on things above. Affection, when the Bible, when the King James, when our Bible was translated, meant the way you think, okay? Today, we think of it as Valentine's Day, but in 1611, it had very close reference to the way we think. So the Bible says, set the way you think on things above. Think like heaven thinks. Don't think like this world thinks. Because the world has a way of thinking about things. And when we just fall in line and fall in line and go along with the world, we're losing. The world is our enemy. We might not do things outwardly because there's a, we're in an environment that would frown on worldly actions. But we will think worldly and we'll justify ourselves because we look like we're not a part of the world. But our thinking will affect the way we look. It will. And it will affect the things that we do. But it can very much start that way. One of the key things about, to me about worldly thinking is that it thinks independent of God. It doesn't necessarily think in opposition to God or it doesn't think it's thinking in opposition to God. It just doesn't think of God. It thinks, the world thinks it can accomplish what it needs to with no reference to God. And when we think about what we have to do and we give no reference to God, we are thinking like the world. Think, oh, I have this problem. How can I solve this? Blah, 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 blah. Never thinking about God. That's worldly thinking. So, unbelievers, the world thinks independently of God, and we must guard against the world's influence. Many of us, I would say all of us, are swayed by the world. We live in this world, we have, and, and it is pervasive. It is everywhere. But I think if we don't recognize that it's everywhere and are not on our guard, we will be swayed by it way more than we even think. More than we realize. The world pumps its filth and philosophy into our minds and uh, you know, the, the sensuality, the sexuality, all of that, it's, it's filthy. But it, the philosophy is there too. It's just continuous. It's, uh, you know, it do, and it does this through many means. We think immediately, I think, of television and movies. Um, us old timers think of television and movies. A lot of people think, what's a television? <laughs> what, what does that tube mean in the word, which, how did it become a word? YouTube, <laughs> you know. But uh, you, whether, media, media. Talk radio, even conservative talk radio. Uh, conservative talk radio, we should be aware of. I'm not saying don't listen to it, but a t conservative talk show host who gives no reference to God and no reference to God's law thinks that he can accomplish what's good for us without God. That's worldly thinking. That's anti-God. Don't love that. Be careful. Again, I'm not saying you can't. We live in this world, but we have to be not of this world. We have a home in heaven. This world is not our home. And we can't go through trying to fit into this world. We need to walk through here as pilgrims, as strangers who don't fit in. So, music, books, magazines, web articles, the Google, <laughs> 
the radio, our phones. Our phones are just a way for that to come right into our hand, just like immediately. So it used to be we could live in a somewhat protected environment and then, you know, go to the grocery store and see magazines and hear music on the, on, you know. Now, that the world is like, it's right there. Where's mine? It's over there. It's right there. As soon as I want to, it can be there. Maybe even without me wanting to. I could be looking for something else and boom, there's an advertisement. And the advertisement makes me laugh about something that the world likes and I should abhor. Humor is funny, okay. but it can, it, sometimes it's funny about things that are good and true, but the world knows what it's doing. Um, so, personalities, influencers, whatever, the, I don't, and I'm probably missing out the, you know, the big thing that, it, that the world is good at right now. I don't know. But unguarded, we, we should always have a guard up. We should always have something that's, that's not kind of out of our control that is a guard. And we can't just think, well, I got this guard up, so I'm safe. Okay. At the same time, we shouldn't think, well, I'm a believer. I don't need no guard. Uh, we need guards. We need things that will, that will help us defend ourselves against the world and beware. Who controls the world's system? Uh, you know, Satan is the one who energizes the world's assault on God and his people. Um, I, I believe that, but I don't know that Satan is, he's the devil, he's a liar, he is a rebel at heart, and so are all of his minions, and I can't believe they don't rebel against him sometime. I'm not saying they side with God, but they're just a bunch of rebels. They have to have fights going on all the time. But whether they're fighting amongst themselves, one thing they do have in common is that they hate God, and they hate anything that's related to God. They want anything that's close to God that God has created to be ruined and and. And, and the Bible does say that the devil is the God of this world. The Bible also says there's no other God but the God of heaven. So the devil thinks he's God. He, people answer to him, but there's none like our God. There's none like our God. He's the only true God, even though some will follow uh, something else, the devil. Um, the God of this world, 2 Corinthians tells us, that he's blinded the minds of them which believe not. Unbelievers, they don't see the one true God. They've been blinded. But can those blinds, blindfolds be removed? Oh yes, they can. And that proves to us that Satan is not the ultimate God of this world. He wants to blind people, but the Holy Spirit, but the God of heaven can rip those blindfolds off and people can turn from their darkness to the glorious light of the gospel. So he is not the absolute ruler over creation. He certainly organizes much of the evil that we see around us. Ephesians 2 says, Wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. This world has a way it wants you to work. Satan is very influential in organizing the course. God has a course for us. Paul has said he had finished his course, right? But, and the world has a course for us to walk in. The course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works now, that now works in the children of disobedience. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. This world is dark. Doesn't mean the sun's not shining, but what this world wants to accomplish is shown here as darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Satan promotes sex, Free sex, murder, blasphemy, obscene language through, uh, through media, all kinds of different media now. He influences the people. He influences the influencers. He influences the people that make the, the, these movies up. 
who, how would somebody get together and just think it on their own? The vulgarity and the vileness that is being dumped out. I don't see it all, but I hear about it that, you know, I hear about it just through the jokes that the Babylon Bee makes about it. You know, this, this new Disney uh, CEO is only going to have seven uh, perverts in a movie instead of however many the last one was going to. That's not real news. But it's saying something. Okay, <laughs> I get it. I think you did too. That, that, doesn't, that, doesn't, that happens because we are bent against God, away from God, by the fall, which was orchestrated by Satan and everything else around it. And Satan, to this day, continues to work against God. And his people that are not fighting Satan are, they think Satan's ideas are good ideas. If it'll bring in money, if it'll, even if it doesn't bring in money anymore, there's things that don't bring in money, but they announce their freedom, which is their rebellion against the God of heaven, oh, that's a good idea. Satan and this world has attacked life through abortion, euthanasia, making suicide plausible, desirable. His, his efforts to de destroy families include um, premarital sex, the free sex of the 60s, that was very influential. Just doesn't matter, we're like a bunch of animals. We can just go and just enjoy ourselves however we want. But why does, why does Satan want to destroy families? It is the primary unit of society. God created the family in the Garden of Eden, and families are blocks that work together to produce the order that God has brought into this world. If, if Satan can destroy the family, the world doesn't like families. They want their order. Um, God created the family to bring order into this world. Husbands, wives, children, rearing up children to become a husband or a wife, and there's that order. Um, but the, but the world doesn't like that. The world would rather the government tell us what order there should be. The, government, the world would rather the government educate our children rather than moms and dads be responsible for the education of the children. The world would rather that the government <clears throat> provide for your welfare, your health, and your stomach rather than families providing for wealth, uh, w welfare, your health, and your stomach. And, and, and the devil has just broken down the family because if the families are broken down, then the government can just step right in. And the government then becomes God. Uh, divorce, no-fault divorce, adultery, redefining what marriage is, <laughs> confusing what it means to be a man or a woman, um, abandonment of child discipline, children rule, um, Satan orchestrates much of this. He uses the world to attack us in three main ways. I think there's much more than that, but the three main ways that we see in, um, maybe I shouldn't say much more than that, but there's more than these three in the whole way the world thinks and has gotten into our thinking. But um, three very important ways that we can see in our text this morning is uh, all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Those three areas um, we're going to just mention quickly here. Satan appeals through the lust of the flesh. Our, fl our flesh is the physical. It's, in it's internal. It is something the devil likes to offer things that make us feel good, we, that, that will make our flesh feel good. It's very, we might say, uh, personal, I don't know. There's so many things here, and we talked about the flesh already, so I'm not going to take this further. But then it says, Satan charms us with the lust of the eyes. The eyes see the material, the surface thing. So the flesh is internal, I would say. It's physical. The eyes are surface. They're material. We look at this. Oh, that looks good. We look at this, and what do we begin to do? Well, we see the looking, and we begin to covet, right? 
Okay, so there's that, and, and there's all different ways to covet. We can, we can covet things that our flesh will like, so there is a mixing this around. We can covet things the, that, that the world sh- enamors us with. We can covet material possessions, the, the you know, love of money, the love of things, all of these things. Um, e- either way, though, when we... When we're enamored, when, we're, when our eyes are beholding something, we have to beware. Okay, our eyes are open, but the eyes of our heart looks here and it looks there. We have the Holy Spirit within us. He, he talks to you. I don't mean like with visions, but you look at this and your con- the Holy Spirit uses your conscience and says, that's the world. And then what does... What, it, what does your soul do? It says, oh, but I like that. I want to fit in with that. We have to beware of it. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I think of the pride of life as being a foundational thing. I am me. Okay? All of us have pride. <laughs> we all have pride. I would like to call it self-respect. We, we should Respect the fact that God created us and he gave us something to do. He has something he wants each one of us to do. So in that sense, I have value. I have value because God valued me. But pride is not the place to go with that. I have value because God valued me. I have abilities because God gave me those abilities, and I should use those. I'm responsible to use what he's given me for his glory and for his honor. There's no reason to be proud, but we can be proud, prideful. Pride is, causes us to seek our own way. I want to do this. I look at this idea, oh, that is, that is neat. Ah, I probably shouldn't do that, but... I want to do that. I want to. I want to um, carry myself in a way that's worldly. Ah, none of my parents' friends walk around that way. But the world walks around that way. I want to do that. That's the world and our pride working together. The pride of life. Pride is the reason Lucifer was cast out of heaven. He is a rebel. Pride is at the root of rebellion. Pride goes before destruction, though. So we have to remember and realize and continually remind ourselves that the world is an enemy. It's our enemy. It's run by Satan, but it's, it's, but it's operated by people just like you. And so it knows what you like. Satan knows what you like. He, the, the devil, you know, he's not um, eternal, and he's not omnipresent, but he's been alive for a long time. He's seen how a lot of people work, and pretty much he's got people figured out. So he knows what will appeal to us. Every day, we're in a battlefield. We don't have to even leave our house to be in a battlefield. We're in a bat- battlefield We must be prepared for the attacks that the world will wage against us and our families. As I was thinking of that statement, I thought of Galatians 6, 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The cross, I don't think that we can really imagine the gruesomeness of the cross, the revulsion that the cross was, cursed is anyone that hangs upon a tree, we should have that revulsion toward the world. By whom the world is crucified unto me, and we should be so much like the Savior 
that the world is revolted by, is revulsed, I don't know what the word is, by us. Oh, you don't want to be around them. They're Christians. They love Christ. If we're that close to Christ and we have that view of the world, it will really help us in the battle that we have with the world. We should be aware that our weak flesh, our flesh is weak, will be tempted by experiences, sights, and pride. I'm reminded of Romans 12 too, and be not conformed to this world. Conforming can happen quickly or slowly. But there's a mold there, and there's a believer here, and you can't be conformed to something if you're not close to it, for one. Just thinking about that. There's a mold and there's a believer. If I'm way far away, I'm not going to be conformed to it. If I'm close, maybe a little bump here, and then I go away and I come back, and, and, and the, the mold gets closer and closer pretty soon. According to this verse, we can be conformed to this world, but we are not to be conformed to this world. We must be aware that we'll be tempted toward the world. There's no need to fear. We are promised victory, but we are challenged not to be of or conformed by the world. Pure religion, James tells us in 127, and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. So John, where our main passage came from, tells us in John 5, 1 John 5, 4, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. So we can overcome the world. We can live a life of victory over the world. But the victory that overcomes the world is our faith. And faith is not just Oh, I believe in God. It's obeying God. If you want to have victory over the world, you obey God. It doesn't have to be, we don't have to know the whole battle plan. All we have to do is follow the first instruction. Obey him about this. Cut this out of your life. Don't go to this place anymore. Don't interact with this person anymore. Whatever. It could be many, many other things. Just obey them. Obey them. Obey the first thing. And then obey the second thing. <laughs> and then after that, the Holy Spirit will say, yep, let's take care of that. And you just keep obeying him. That's faith. Faith obeys, and you obey, and that gives you victory over the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in it we have so much instruction that applies to us in every aspect of our lives. We pray that, Lord, I ask that you would use something that was said this morning to help, um, help us in our battle against the world. In our, in our, we're, we, we live in this world, but Lord, you've said you've left us here. You want us to influence the world, not it to overcome us. You want us to reach in the world and, and reach each person in the world because you love the world so much that you gave Christ to die for it. Lord, help us not to be influenced. Help us not to be conformed to this world. Help us to be crucified to the world. Help us to be a revulsion to those that would seek to evangelize us toward the world. Help us to see the world for the revulsion that it is to you and to your son, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.